Each session will be led by our chairman and presenters. They will present and discuss on four different topics. So now let us begin the session one. The topic of the first session is AI and fairness. The presentations and discussion by panelists will revolve around whether we can build an AI that can fairly process differences created by diversity. Uh, actually, with the rapid development of artificial intelligence technology, uh, there are also problems that we need to think about uh, together, including fairness. So, please welcome the chair for the first session, Professor Seo Chang Ho at the School of Electrical Engineering at KAIST, and our panel with a big hand. Okay, thank you. Welcome to this session. My name is Cheng Ho Su. I'm a chair of this session titled AI and Fairness. And in this session, we're going to have a four uh, presentation and followed by the one panel discussion. Then each presentation takes around the 10 to 15 minutes, and each panel discussion takes around the 10 to 20 minutes. But the panel discussion may be shorter or longer than scheduled, depending on how each presentation goes on. So this session is about the following. So as we all know that, the AI is everywhere, right? So AI becomes more and more crucial in many applications, which is now concerned the human a right related to critical issue, right? And the fairness is one such critical issue. So this session is about the fairness issue that arises in AI. So for example, so we're gonna discuss whether it is possible to develop a model which ensure fairness, and if so, and figure out what the way is. So that's what we're gonna do. And we have a four speaker, very broad and very good lineup. The, the order of the presentation are the following. The first speaker is a Tulsi Dossi from Google, and the second speaker is a Kang Ung Lee from the University of the, uh, Wisconsin Madison, and the third is a Bing Kim, again from Google, and the last is a Stephen Huang from KAIST. So I think this is a very good lineup, at least in terms of the speaker organization. So we have a perfect fairness, why? So we have two female and the two male. It's a gender fairness, right? And uh, we have also the two from academia and two from industry affiliation perfect fairness. So I hope from this session we can exchange some fair opinion on some AI. That's what I'm guessing. So now let's get into the detail. So let me first introduce the first speaker, a little bit more detail. And the first speaker is a Tulsi Dolsi from Google. And as you can see, she's very young, right? She seems around 20 what, right? 20 something, right? Okay, that's what I'm guessing, but she's a head. She's amazing. She's a head of product for Google. Google is a big company, but she's a head for Google. I don't understand what's going on. It's not fair. It's amazing. She's leading a group for the developing AI-based product that are inclusive and ethical. Okay, I don't know what that means, but anyway, she has also been recognized as one of the top women in the AI ethics fields, and she obtained a bachelor and master degree from Stanford. Today, she will be talking about some fairness issues that arise in the product experience, which I'm really curious about. So title of the talk is Equality and Equity in the Product Experience. And without further ado, let's welcome the speaker, Tulsi. Please go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to, to speaking today and to being a part of this panel um, with these awesome speakers. Um, so let me present my screen really quickly. Um, let's see if this works. Da -da. Okay, can you see my screen and still hear me? Yes, I can see you very well and I can hear you very well. Please go ahead. Awesome, cool. All right, so um, as was introduced, I'm uh, Tulsi, I had product efforts at Google around responsible AI. And so that means I work with our various product teams, um, think about you know, YouTube, search, photos, to think about what does it mean to build fair, 
equitable experiences in our products, right? How do we make sure that our products are in fact inclusive? And so what I'll do today is I'll just share a little bit about, you know, how do we think about what that, what it means to build a fair and inclusive product? What are some of the examples of unfairness in products and how have we thought about that um, in, you know, 10 minutes? And uh, then, you know, can also talk through this more and answer more questions throughout the panel. So before I jump into kind of specific products, I wanted to start with these, this slide, because this is slide reflects Google AI principles. And these are seven principles of what we believe AI should do, and four principles of applications that we will not pursue. And what these really represent is our gold standard of what we believe AI products should be achieving as we build them. The second one here is, is really the one that I focus on from an AI fairness perspective, which is avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. Of course, the tricky part of this is what does it mean to avoid or create reinforce unfair bias? How do we identify that in our products? And who are we being fair or unfair to, right? To the introduction, we can talk about gender fairness, for example. We can also talk about racial bias. We can talk about cultural biases that exist across different societal contexts. The kinds of fairness issues we may talk about in Korea, for example, may be different than the fairness issues we talk about in the United States. And so how do we really think about that global lens of defining what fairness means and also how fairness looks in different products? And that's something I'll talk about today. I wanna also highlight that I think one of the big things for Google is really making responsible AI a built-in part of the product process. And that's a large part of what my job is today because we really do believe that responsible AI translates to successful AI. And if we just keep the principles on paper, that doesn't actually mean anything. How do you actually build those into practice? And so the way we actually do that from a product perspective is usually in these three pillars. The first is how do you actually develop a knowledge base, developing research, best practices, resources. Bean, who you'll hear from in a, in a bit, is one of our amazing researchers who is really pushing the field forward in terms of how do we actually define and build best practice in this space? Then the question becomes, how do we actually translate that work to our products? And often we find that the research in its you know, purely academic form doesn't actually translate directly to our products and that we have to make modifications. Maybe the technique doesn't work for a particular use case. Maybe we need to modify it. Maybe also different users or different stakeholders need different outcomes. And then how can we share our learnings, build those perspectives and work together to keep iterating on them? So here's, a, here's an example kind of of what this actually looks like. So there's hundreds of classifiers across Google and across the industry that aim to do things like identifying hate, harassment, abuse, spam, right? So for example, you see this text classifier on the right, there's two comments here. The first one is, what a sweet puppy, I want to hug her forever. That's a really nice, innocuous, safe comment. So we give it a very low toxicity score, a score of 0 0.07. Whereas the comment, you are the worst example of a puppy I've ever seen is a really mean comment. And we give it a score of 0.84, highly toxic, right? So this classifier essentially scores things on a scale of zero to one with zero being very safe and one being very harmful. And so while that is a good classifier, very effective when you're talking about puppies and hate, fairness concerns arise very easily in the way that we classify comments about identity. So when we first released this API in 2017, this toxicity API, one of our customers found this example where the sentence, I am straight, was given a score of 0 0.07, while the sentence, I am gay, was given a score of 0.84, highly toxic. Right? And of course, this is not something we want to see our products doing. It's not an equitable experience by any means. And in fact, what we find is that it's really making a determination based on a single term. And of course, that by itself opens up many questions about what do we define as fair? What is the experience supposed to look like? And how do we make sure that we actually evaluate these things before the product launches in the first place? It also brings up the question of why do these problems exist in the first place? If we were thoughtful about the way that we were creating this toxicity API, why did this happen, right? And as you know, many probably will talk about throughout the day, when we think about the machine learning pipeline, the critical thing is that bias can enter at any stage of this pipeline, right? From the point of collecting data, to labeling that data, to training, to filtering, to users seeing the effect, right? So if we think about that in the context of this toxicity API, where did I get the data from, right? What websites does it represent? What types of users or conversations does it represent? Then when you actually go to labeling the data, who labeled it? 
with what connotations, what did we decide was toxic or not toxic? How did we actually train the model under what objective? What happened to the user data and what was the effect? And the thing is, is that pipeline is consistent and human bias throughout that pipeline is consistent regardless of what product. But the toxicity API is really only one, one example of the kinds of fairness issues we see in our products. And because the different uses and the different products that we build are so different, the fairness concerns can also be very different. So a good example of this is, of course, the seminal fairness work that was done by Job Willemwini and Timnit Gebru around gender shades. And this was looking at a classification problem. And so similar to the toxicity uh, API, you start looking at, okay, how well are we classifying different communities uh, across these images? And in this case, the question was, how well are we classifying gender across different skin tones and actual gender presentations? And you see, of course, that for certain communities, the systems are working much more poorly than in others. And that's a very different fairness problem than the one we see in Google Translate. In Google Translate, we had concerns between translating between two languages. In this example, Turkish is a non-gendered language, which means the pronouns in this, in this language don't actually apply to he or she, right? So in Turkish, obir hemsire actually translates to this person is a nurse. But when we actually translate it into Google Translate, we were finding that we were learning systemic biases in the way that we use language, learning that she is a nurse while he is a doctor. Both of these concerns, like the toxicity API, are fairness concerns, but they manifest in different ways. And as a result, the way we actually need to solve them are also different. In gender shades, the authors were able to show significant progress through data augmentation and collection, going out and finding more data that represented more diversity in terms of culture, skin tone, gender presentation, and the intersections of these things. Whereas in Translate, we found that actually, while we did need to improve the model and we are continuing to do so, there actually needed to be more done. If you think about that translate experience, translating from a one language to another, even if we made the model perfectly accurate or very close to it, the model is actually lacking some of the context in this experience, right? Am I talking about a male person, a female person, potentially a gender non-binary person? And what does that mean for the actual translation? And so what we realized is in addition to improving the model, we actually also needed to improve the user experience. Translating friend here, for example, into both the masculine and the feminine version when translating into Spanish. And so this is something we're continuing to work on and continuing to expand, but I think it's a really good illustration of the fact that fairness problems come in many different forms. They come through many different parts of the ML pipeline, and they also need to be handled in many different ways. And truly, this I think for me, the big takeaway is that fairness in product development is highly contextual because the decision makers who are choosing to make the product, what user groups we're making it for, where we get our data sets, what metrics we actually use and apply, um, all impact what the end experience is. And I think we need to think about these fairness problems much more holistically than a single technical solution or a single product solution, but rather as a composite of all of those things. So how do you actually then go about doing that in the model development process? Well, the first piece of it is actually establishing the problem with a diverse set of users in mind, right? So who am I actually trying to work for? And how can I make sure that I do user research with those sets of users? How can I bring in perspectives and community involvement? How can they then collect data that reflects the diversity of that user base? Then can I define fairness opportunities and actually test and test and test, right? The big thing we learned from that jigsaw toxicity API example that I showed earlier is that having the right metrics at the onset could be huge. Had we sliced the performance of our model by different identity terms like straight and gay, I think we would have caught this problem much earlier, probably before the product launched. And that would have been huge in terms of making the experience fairer and more representative. And then based on what we test and what we learn, design those mitigation approaches in terms of augmenting data, in terms of improving model training, in terms of changing the product experience, and make sure to continue to monitor that performance throughout. Lastly, of course, goes without saying a little bit, but you know, the big thing that we do need to do as an industry is continue to develop and grow an inclusive workforce and to bring in perspectives globally, um, to bring in perspectives across different communities and regions so that we can actually make this most effective. So today, even for the ML process, we ask these questions at every stage of that pipeline that I showed earlier. 
from defining the problem to collecting the data, to evaluating, to deploying and monitoring. And in each of these, we set questions that we want our teams to answer. What problems will the model solve? Going to, is the training data skewed? How was the model tested? Is it stable and high performing? Is it trustworthy? And this actually prompts us as you know, the responsible AI side of it, but also the actual product developer to ask and think about these questions at every stage of the process. And we can provide tools to actually support each stage of this process. And so actually, if you are interested in learning more about these tools, you can actually go to tensorflow.com slash responsible AI, and you'll actually be able to see the full picture here. Um, but I'll quickly talk about the evaluation bucket, although there are, of course, tools at every phase of this pipeline. And with evaluation, you can actually evaluate in multiple different ways, starting from you know, slicing uh, by terms to actually investigating individual data points to, to debugging and explaining predictions. And throughout this process, it could make a huge difference in terms of being able to build tools and experiences um, that can actually uh, drive this work forward. So with that, um, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Uh, to talk more about fairness and, and what that actually means in the product development process. I just wanted to end with some of the tools and examples that you can use as you're building these products for similar things like the jigsaw toxicity example. In fact, if you go to tensorflow.com slash responsible AI, you'll also see examples of case studies of our own products and how we've used these tools uh, to address those concerns. Uh, so with that, I'll stop presenting. Thank you so much for having me and looking forward to chatting more. Okay. So thanks a lot for an exciting talk. And uh, actually, the talk was very uh, insightful to me. And I also learned a lot from her talk. And But I believe it's also the case to the audience, like me. But uh, due to the interest of time, the later in the panel discussion, we're going to have a Q&A. So let's, just for now, let's move on to the second speaker. And the second speaker is uh, Kang Wook Lee from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Actually, I know him very well because uh, I've been collaborating with him uh, for many years, until even now. And in the past, actually, he was working as a postdoc at KAIST. And uh, before that, um, he obtained a PhD degree from UC Berkeley. And there's a one thing I'd like to highlight about him. That's the following. So he's an amazing guy. He's a very unusual. He's a very unique. And he's very distinctive in many aspects. OK, what does that mean? So he obtained a bachelor degree from KAIST, actually. So when he was an uh, undergraduate student at KAIST, you know what? He was a professional ga pro gamer, professional gamer of a very well-known strategy game named the StarCraft. StarCraft. He was a gamer. He was not a student. He was just a gamer. But very surprisingly, he became a researcher, but very good researcher. Here's the one evidence. One evidence is that around two years ago, he received a very prestigious award from the IEEE uh, Communication Society and Information Society. So he's an amazing guy. So I believe that uh, he'll be, today he'll be talking about some very amazing stuff, but not about game, of course, but about the sort of boring topic, but very important topic. There's a fairness in AI. So let's uh, welcome the speaker, the Kang Wook Lee. So Kang Wook, please go ahead. Thank you so much for a great introduction, Kang Wook. Um, can you guys see my screen well? Hopefully, I guess. Um, can you guys hear me well? Yes, and, and I can hear you very well. So you can go ahead. OK, perfect. All right, um, thanks for a great introduction. Um, and thanks for reminding me myself of my uh, 10 years or younger version of me. Um, it's my really great honor to give a talk about my recent work on how we can improve fairness via federated learning. This is a joint work with my students here at UW-Madison. So before I move on, let me Briefly overview the research background in my lab. So I have background from information theory and coding theory. I've been working on scale over machine learning systems, sample efficient machine learning algorithms. And recently I've been focusing more on how we can design trustworthy machine learning algorithms and systems. What I'm gonna talk about today is an intersection between these two different verticals, um, between trustworthy ML and scale over ML. In particular, I'm gonna focus on how we can achieve fairness in a large scale machine learning system to where data set is stored in a decentralized manner. So let me be more precise. Um, before I move on to fair version of it, I start with unfair version of it first. 
So let's say I have three hospitals in my country, RGB. There are three hospitals. Each of them has their own data set. Let's say I'm the government and I want to train a classifier using all of their data. But of course they don't want to share data because that's their customer's data. So how can we um, solve this problem? There are a few approaches. The first approach is centralized version of it. So even though the problem you want to solve is a decentralized version, you basically reduce it to the centralized version. In other words, each hospital lets the government take their own data. Let me just visualize it, which is called take my data scheme. So each hospital submits their data to government. Government collects the entire data set. And now it has the entire data set from collected from the entire country. You can train a model using their own service servers. You can get a really good working model. So how is good is this model in terms of accuracy? It is a really good model because you have collected the entire data set in a single point. So you can have a really high accuracy, but privacy wise, this is really bad choice because all of those data stored at these hospitals, they are all compromised. What about the other extreme? The other extreme is hospitals refuse to submit or share their data, share their data with the government. So they can, instead, what they do is they train their own model within their organization without sharing any data with anyone else. Hospital R trains their own model. Hospital G trains its own model. B does the same. And once you have these three different models, you submit and share these models with the government. So now the government collects these three different models. You don't, you don't get to see their data, but you get the outcomes of this training. And you somehow come up with a way to take an ensemble of these three models. That's what you can do. You do whatever you want, get the best model out of it. So this is a second scheme, which is local training followed by some ensemble. So how good is this approach? is private because each hospital didn't share any data with the government. Of course, they shared the model, which is some outcome of the data set. So there's some information like it, technically speaking, but let's not worry too much about that. So you never share the data, so it's still private. Accuracy is going to be pretty bad. You can actually show that this approach, there's no way you can get a good accuracy. All right, so now let's take a look at the accuracy privacy trade-off. The first scheme I mentioned, take my data scheme. We call it centralized training. It's got good accuracy, but bad privacy. Local training followed by ensemble, it's got good privacy, but bad accuracy. And you can prove that there's no way you can do better than that. So then the question here is, can you take the, the advantages of these two schemes? Can you have good accuracy and good privacy? Turns out five years ago, um, researchers from Google proposed something called federated learning. And they show that you can actually have a really good trade-off between this accuracy and privacy by running their proposed algorithm, which is called federated learning. So I go through the, um, what federated learning means. So similar to the, the second scheme that we just mentioned, you have three hospitals, they are training their own models locally but instead of training all the way to the end and just sharing the final outcome, they are going to share some of the intermediate research. I'm hiding all these technical details, but roughly speaking, this is what federated learning is doing. They are doing local training, but they are sharing their intermediate research while they are training their models. And as a result, they are going to come up with one consensus model as a final outcome. And that's the model they are going to collectively report to the government. And both theoretically and empirically, people have shown that it's got a good privacy and it's got good accuracy. So that last five years, researchers have devoted their efforts to study and better understand the trade-off between accuracy and privacy. And we know that federated learning can achieve a really good trade-off between these two. But again, uh, as Tulsi mentioned, we are missing one important metric in this figure, which is fairness. So what can we, what do we know about this three-way trade-off, accuracy, privacy, and fairness? 
we actually don't know much about it. So that's the um, topic that I'm gonna talk about today. Again, um, fairness, I want to just briefly mention once more, Tools gave really great applications and examples. This is one another example of unfair machine learning model. It's a pretty popular one found by ProPublica in the state. So in the United States, when you go to jail, they use this kind of machine learning model to make a decisions in a pre-trial jail. And they found that the model that people were using is actually not fair. So in this example, there are two people and Vernon and Brisha, they have this profiles and background history. If you fit their model, if you fit their profile to the model, the first one got low risk, even though he's got two armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery before. On the other hand, Brisha has got high risk as an outcome of the model, even though she only has done four juvenile misdemeanors. So you can see that this is clearly unfair. It's not just one or two particular examples. You can actually see that there's a statistical gap between the failure rate or mistakes made by this model, and that depends on the skin tone. So we can say this model is not fair. All right, so that was just a quick reminder of the definition of fairness. Now going back to this three-way trade-off, what we know about it. So again, in this three-way trade-off, if you ignore the privacy access, and if you only look at the bottom part of this graph, it actually goes back to accuracy fairness trait. So if you only look at the bottom plane, 2D plane, now it goes back to accuracy fairness trade-off, where also a lot of researchers have studied how we can trade off accuracy and fairness. And it turns out that a lot of things are known and we can use a new mitigation algorithms than just standard training method. And we can call it fair training. And if you think about the centralized fair training, is still going to have low privacy, but you can trade off between accuracy and fairness at that low privacy budget. But then the question is, actually open questions before us were, what about the accuracy fairness trade off while satisfying high privacy requirement? What about the privacy level of the federated learning? What about the um, even higher privacy? Uh, let's say local training in Aung San Suu Kyi. can you make it make them fair? So in this work, uh, we have analyze the, this three-way trade-off. In particular, we show that how fair each of these three schemes can be. In other words, we show that how fair, what is the maximum fairness local training scheme can have, what is the maximum fairness federated learning can have, what is the maximum fairness centralized training scheme can have. So now we move, on, uh, move back to the, this new plane, which is privacy and fairness. So this is a new trade-off that we are going to understand in this paper. Now I only focus on this 2D plane. X-axis now becomes fairness, Y-axis becomes privacy. It's pretty similar to, be, to, the, to the previous picture, but there's one main difference. In the previous picture where we only looked at the trade-off between accuracy and fairness, I'm sorry, accuracy and privacy, Federated learning was able to achieve the, the advantages of the two different schemes. It was able to get good accuracy at the same time with good privacy. But now in this new trade-off, we show that federated fair learning cannot achieve good enough fairness. So then there's another open question followed by our research, which is, uh, can we achieve this good advantages of two schemes, even in the, um, this new setting. So the answer is we have proposed a new solution. It's called FATFB. So FATFB is the name of our algorithm we propose in this work. And it turns out that this algorithm cannot achieve the advantages of these two schemes. So let me just quickly introduce what FATFB is and we'll wrap up my presentation. So FATFB is actually the application of the algorithm called fair batch which I worked on and developed together with Professor So and Professor Huang at KAIST. And here's the algorithm. So this was designed for centralized training. So you have a model, you have a data set, you train it. Fairbatch is an, another module that can be applied together with any training algorithm. What it does is, as Trucy mentioned, it observes how the model behaves within each slice. So you look at per group loss values, or per slice loss values, if you wish. And then it helps the training algorithm rebalance the data set or reweight the data set accordingly so that the outcome of the training model becomes fair. 
So it's a very simple idea, but you have pretty good theoretical guarantees why it works and so on. And it's got pretty good state-of-the-art performance on many data sets. Federated version of this is very similar um, extension what we saw in before. So each hospital runs fair batch, but now not just sharing their intermediate research in the training site, fair batch modules are also sharing some of the intermediate research. That's it. And we show that this algorithm can achieve the state-of-the-art performance on achieving group fairness on many data sets. I will skip those numbers. Two main takeaways from my presentation. First, we have fully understood, I would say, the trade-off between accuracy and privacy, starting from the federated learning work in 2016. Now we have understood about everything, but we still have to study uh, another more difficult problem, which is fair learning with decentralized training, decentralized data, three-way trade-off is still widely open. Another takeaway is our current solution, Federated Fair Batch, is achieving the state-of-the-art performances. I'm happy to discuss further about our method, happy to share how it works uh, in practice. Thanks for listening. And I will um, let, the, let Chang will continue from here. Okay, thanks a lot for a very nice talk, and I uh, really uh, impressive that uh, you got some uh, really nice result. Okay, congratulations. So actually, I have a lot of questions for clarification about your talk, but as I mentioned before, we don't have enough time. So due to interest of time, we'll just move on to the next speaker. So we will have a more discussion in the panel discussion. P please stay tuned. So third speaker is uh, Bean Kim from Google. And uh, Bean Kim is a staff research scientist at Google Brain. And uh, she has been working on the interpretable machine learning, which is uh, nowadays very important in many applications. And she's a recipient of the UNESCO Net Tax Pro Award. And she was also a keynote speaker at ECML and a tutorial speaker at the ICML. And she also has served as an area chair in many top conferences like um, URIPS and ICML and ICLR. So that's amazing. So she obtained a PhD degree from MIT. So today she'll be sharing some of her experience about her learning how her complicated friend, neural network, sees the word. Okay, I don't know what that means. So, but it looks interesting anyway, nonetheless. So actually I'm wondering how her talk is uh, related to the fairness topic of this session interest. So I look forward to seeing the relationship, if any. So let's try to figure that out. So let's welcome the third speaker, Bean Kim. So pl Bean, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. That was such a great segue to what I'm going to talk about, how to connect that interpretability to fairness, which is the topic of this panel. OK, very um, good. <laughs> So let me go ahead. So thanks for having me. Um, uh, I hope you can all see and hear me. I uh, Thanks for having me. It's a great honor to be here today and discussing this with the, with the crowd that I very much respect. Um, we live in a very interesting time where we created this thing, machine learning models, or a particular neural network that I'm going to talk about today, that we can't quite reason about. While each component that makes this thing, our friend, makes sense to us, when we put it together, it's way too complicated to understand. So I've been long been working on how to interpret this friend, interpretability. But at some point I started wondering and started thinking that there's so much more in studying neural network, just my complicated friend, than simply interpreting it. What do I mean? Well, this complicated friend called neural network apparently can do things better than us, some of the things. And this friend seems to see the world in a different way, reason about it using perhaps concepts that we don't really understand. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Like, don't you wonder how this friend reasons the world so that perhaps we can learn something new? Or studying this friend as if it, it's a scientific object, like we study black holes. And personally, I am just so eager to talk to this friend and just to get to know this friend. And to have that conversation, we need to use the same language. And how to develop this language is what really interests me. So interpretability is about having this dialogue, enabling this dialogue. And once we can have the dialogue, we can ask a lot of questions, such as, how do you see the world? 
we we have this idea of uh, we have this fundamental phenomenon in human perception called gestalt, which means when you look at this try when you look at this uh, picture right here, humans can't help themselves but seeing a triangle. Although triangle isn't there, but your 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 brain is uh, connecting dots that there must be a triangle. So we ask a simple question: Does the neuron network see the same thing? And it turns out that answer is yes, but only if our friend can uh, generalize and train to generalize. We can ask a little more complicated questions, although both are complicated. Then we can say, okay, we have this machine, Alpha Zero, that can play chess better than humans, and it's all self-trained. It, it never seen any human chess playing data. How does it work? How is it playing chess? What kind of a chess playing concepts that it has internally? And this is a new work uh, with a collaboration with DeepMind. But you might say, wait, wait, this panel is about fairness. What does interoperability has to do with fairness? Well, interpretability is about enabling that dialogue. Now, when you have a fairness criteria like equalized odds, that you know exactly two groups that you would like to, in a way, fair, uh, then you give that criteria to the machine and machine will say, all right, I got you, I'll, uh, I will execute that. And it will just optimize it. This is not even a dialogue. However, we know the fairness is often more complicated. When you don't know all the risks, uh, you don't know how to divide that group, you don't know what else can go wrong. You thought you thought about every single thing that could go wrong, but something else that you never thought of might go wrong once you deploy that model. So there's a lot of complexity, like what Tulsi uh, talked about, and that's when you need interpretability, because then you too have to have a dialogue. So one type of dialogue that we can have with our friend is to ask, okay, tell me how are you making this prediction? And that's one of the most popular uh, first step in interpretability that people are trying to focus. So for instance, if you have an image and this image is predicted as a Junko bird, then we ask, how did you make that decision? And the machine answers with pixels highlighted with, with respect to how important those pixels are for the prediction. But it turns out that generating this explanation or what we call maps, alien C maps, is hard. But it turns out there's something much more harder, which that caused miscommunication, the confirmation bias. So I'm gonna talk briefly about this. So this method is family of methods is called saliency maps. And thanks to the elegance uh, and simplicity of the basis of these methods, there has been explosion of methods for generating saliency maps, including my own work from 18. And when you look at these explanations, that's it's just six explanations, it kind of makes sense. There is a bird, uh, explanation shows kind of the bird and maybe the branch that the bird is sitting on. Sure, makes sense. Uh, until we stopped and asked the sending to check question. So these pixels are the evidence of prediction because that's ultimately what we're trying to explain. Uh, so that means that the whatever function that generate this picture takes the input image and the prediction as an input. So that means when the input changes, when the prediction changes, the explanation should change. And in extreme case, when the prediction is random, then the explanation should really change. But it turns out that's not quite the case. So we have this neural network that can take an image, predict, uh, superhuman performance and also gen we can generate saliency maps of different kinds as many times as we want and we copy and paste the network started randomizing the weights and now as soon as you randomize any layer a prediction is completely random it turns out that you can you cannot quantitatively or qual qualitatively tell them apart the one from trained network or uh, from the one from untrained network the random network in fact Three out of the six explanations that I just showed you a couple of slides ago are generated from random network. Now, I challenge you to guess which one they are. And if you can, please do reach out because uh, you might be superhuman. The answer is popular method number two and my work from uh, the 18 number two and popular method number four. So one of the reasons uh, that we conject, uh, conjecture as to what went wrong is a, a confirmation bias that we all humans have. What is it? Well, when we looked at the bird picture, we expected to see a bird in our explanation. And we did. 
So we liked it. I was right. And this is such a fundamental aspect of a human. So we didn't stop to ask, wait a second, is, is what I'm looking at really a true explanation until many years later? And in addition to confirmation bias, another issue is that machines are speaking in language of pixels. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't speak in pixels. I use high level concepts like feather or beak to explain what this bird was. So perhaps if machines can speak in that language, perhaps we, we would have known something weird is going on early on, earlier than we did. So we pursue that direction, enabling our friend to speak like us, use the language that humans use to communicate with each other, high level concepts. So we have a family of methods on this, but the basic backbone of this idea called TCAV is pretty simple. And it's simple enough that I can explain in one slide. So let me try that. So let's say you have a concept striped and you have some example of what, you, what, it, what that means to you. And you're curious whether that concept is important for classifying zebra. Now, the first step is to learn a vector in the embedding space of a neural network that represents that concept. What does it mean? Well, it's just a vector that, that points to the concept embedding activation uh, from random activations. And then you take a derivative, a directional derivative. This measures how sensitive is the prediction of the zebra, the, the neuron of a predict, uh, the, the logic layer, is sensitive to if I change a very small amount of this concept. And aggregated statistics of that becomes the TCAP score, which is a number between always zero and one. And that's it. Um, now I can, uh, I can show you the results from the paper, uh, but I'm going to show you a series of work that's done by other people I was not involved because I think being adopted in the wide domain, wide domain of application is the most living evidence of how powerful this idea of concept-based explanation is. So this is work from King's College London, where they use TCAP to interpret cardiac MRI classification. They also train a generative model so they can, in fact, generate different data, uh, data set, well, the data points with different concepts. This is left ventricle in your heart, it's this empty spot, uh, and more left ventricle and less left ventricle. Now, what they wrote in the conclusion really ringed my heart, uh, where they say interpretability using known biomarkers allow the model's prediction to be placed in the context of current medical knowledge and clinical decision-making guidelines. And I was so happy when I saw this, because that's exactly what we had in mind when we worked on this method. Some other work working on uh, medical examples, uh, breast cancer, for example, you can use these medical concepts that doctors use and trained to reason and communicate with each, with each other and use the same thing with machines. Science example, uh, Eric from Aerospace Corporation used TCAP to interpret category of a storm classification model. So before I close, uh, I just want you to remember that interpretability is about enabling that dialogue. In a lot of cases, fairness is an inherently complica complicated problem, complex problem. And I think it is inevitable that we have to have that dialogue in order to accurately and effectively address the problem of fairness. With that, I will uh, return my mic. Okay, thanks a lot for a very interesting talk. So now I understand why the um, uh, interpretable ML plays some role in understanding fairness. But, uh, uh, okay, so the, frankly speaking, I, I don't quite understand very well the relationship. But, uh, okay, we don't have enough time, so let's just move on to the last speaker. So in the panel discussion, we can have a further detail. Okay, the last speaker is uh, Stephen Wang. He's my colleague, actually, at KAIST. So that's why I know him very well in person. And in addition to that, I know him very well personally because I've been collaborating with him for the past three years and on a uh, fairness topic that he may be presenting today. So here's um, his uh, research interest. So his research interests are the data-centric and the responsible AI. And um, so today he'll be talking about some interesting machine learning techni techniques 
for responsible AI. So let's welcome uh, Stephen, and uh, please go ahead. All right. Um, thank you, Professor Saul, for the <clears throat> nice introduction. So I'm Stephen from KAIS. I'm really happy to give this talk along with a distinguished line of speakers who I, uh, whom I really respect. So the title of my talk is Responsible AI, Model-Centric and Data-Centric Approaches. All right. So as uh, Tulshi mentioned um, in her talk, Responsible AI is important in many companies. We heard a lot of details. I really appreciated her details uh, uh, within Google of how uh, AI uh, must be used responsibly in addition to uh, just performing well. Um, in addition to Google, other companies like IBM and Microsoft are also equally interested in, in this issue. So this is very important. So I'd like to give an academic perspective. I, I really appreciated the product uh, uh, aspect. Um, and so I think what are the key issues in responsible AI include the following. Uh, fairness, robustness, privacy and security, explainability, and so on. And um, kang was talking about the combination of fairness uh, and privacy. And um, our lab has been focusing on the first two for a while, fairness and robustness. Uh, the reason we like the, this combination is that both of these issues are largely affected by the training data quality. All right, so uh, Kang Wook also already showed you this example, but um, there's uh, to motivate, fairness is about not discriminating, and there's a tool called Compass that is used by US courts for predict, predicting a defendant's risk of committing another crime. And the problem with this tool is it's automatic, it's all, uh, very convenient, but it overestimates uh, black people's recidivism risk. This is the probability of a person recommitting a crime uh, compared to white people, so it's unfair. Um, robustness is about defending against attacks. So nowadays, uh, data is easier to publish, well, which means it's easier to poison as well. So you can um, use uh, search engines, reputable ones like Google Dataset Search, to find a, lo a lot of datasets nowadays. And it's very easy to post uh, data your own datasets as well. And the problem is that you know, this, this data can be harvested by web crawlers of unsuspecting victims. And so if you poison the data, you know, I'm showing you an example on the bottom left where uh, you can just flip a, a few labels. I mean, that's also considered poison, data poisoning. Um, you can, someone can just use that data. So these poisoning attacks are actually becoming increasingly sophisticated. So as Tulshi mentioned, uh, responsible AI is not just about model training. So machine learning actually involves a lot of steps. Um, you start from the data. That's where you um, learn from, right? So you need to collect your data. You need to clean and validate it. Uh, after model training, you need to evaluate the model. And then you have to, may have to manage a bunch of models and serve them to the world. And so responsible AI needs to be addressed in all of these steps. And um, systems like TensorFlow Extended, uh, which I used to work on in my previous life, and um, MLflow are uh, systems that strive to do this. So I'd like to um, summarize the research that we've been doing. So we worked on uh, multiple steps as shown here. And um, they can be largely divided into model-centric and data-centric approaches. By model-centric, I mean it's more focused on the model training, uh, data-centric, I mean, it's more fo there's more focus on preparing the data. So I'm going to go through uh, three works in brief. Uh, the first work I'd like to highlight, um, sample selection for fair, robust training, is um, actually being presented today at the NeurIPS conference. So uh, at this moment, probably. Um, so let me talk, uh, get a little, uh, little into the te te uh, techniques. So what is model fairness? Um, the notion of fairness, as uh, Tushi mentioned, is very subjective. There's, uh, it really depends on the context. But um, it can uh, express, be expressed as a function using the following ingredients. The classifier, the sensitive attribute like gender or race, or, and the uh, training uh, labels. And depending on which ingredient you use, um, you can define different measures. In this talk, for simplicity, we're going to use one of the prominent measures called disparate impact. So the definition as follows, I'm, I'm going to explain this uh, mathematical expression. It's saying that uh, for different sensitive groups, here z equals 0, z equals 1 means men and women, or white and black people, and so on. Um, the probabilities of a model making a positive prediction, that's what I mean by y hat being 1, 
um, need to be similar. So in our running example for white and black populations, the COMPASS tool must predict recidivism with um, similar probabilities. Now, whether or not that's the right fairness measure depends on your application. But let's say that's, that's what we want to obtain. Now, we can change this notion of fairness to a number, um, as shown below, where we take the ratio of these two probabilities and take the minimum of one of them. So limiting this to um, some p percent is called the p percent rule. And so I'm going to use this uh, disparate impact measure in our uh, running example. And this is going to be the most uh, technical slide in this talk. All right, let's move on to a um, simple motivating example. Now, uh, let's say that we have sensitive groups, black and white people, and that we have 10 people. Um, five are white, five are black. So the Ws are white people, blacks, uh, Bs are the black people. Let's say that among them, um, we, the green boxes indicate positive label. They're going to uh, re recommit crime. Let's say there's only one feature X for simplicity. Now here I like to somehow divide these 10 people in half somewhere, such that um, using a uh, so-called threshold classifier, where everyone on the right side of this um, the dotted line is, uh, has a positive prediction. It's predicted to be positive, and the people on the left side to be negatively predicted. So um, if you're only focusing on accuracy, then you can come up with a perfect classifier as shown as the red dotted line. Uh, because all the people on the right of the dotted line have the green boxes, the positive labels, while the ones on the left-hand side are perfectly classified as negative. Right? So accuracy is therefore one. Uh, unfortunately, this result is not, this classifier is not fair. And if you compute the disparate impact I just in, uh, explained in the previous slide, um, you need to compute the probability of positive predictions. And if you look at the Ws, um, out of the five Ws, uh, two of them are on the right-hand side of the red dotted line. So uh, that's 40%. Whereas among the five Bs, um, only uh, eight of them are on the right-hand side. So you get a positive prediction rate of 80%. So they're not the same. And according to our objective, it's not considered fair. And if you take the ratio, the disparate impact can be computed as 0.5. Okay, so this classifier is not fair. Now, you can come up with a fair classifier uh, where you can uh, obtain perfect DI fairness and try to maximize accuracy. So if you look at the blue dotted line, um, I'm gonna skip the computation now because I think you have a uh, sense of how it works. The, accurate, the uh, disparate impact is now one because the two uh, po probabilities are the same, so it's fair. Uh, but the accuracy drops a little bit from 1 to uh, 0 0.8 because the third and fourth uh, Ws are now misclassified. They have positive labels, but uh, they have negative labels, but they're predicted to be positive. So um, this is pretty much what the fairness algorithms in the literature are trying to achieve, uh, although this is a simplified example. Okay, so now let's add um, another dimension, uh, dimension of uh, complexity. Um, data poisoning. So what happens if we add poisoning to the data? Um, a popular method of poisoning is to flip labels, as I briefly introduced in a few slides ago. Here, let's say that we flip the labels of two Bs, uh, as shown below. So we have poison data. And the question is, can we, simply, can we continue to just use our fairness algorithms? So what happens if we just ignore the poisoning? That, that seems like an easy approach. Uh, the problem is that we may end up with a um, worse trade-off in terms of accuracy and, and fairness, as shown uh, here. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm doing here is, on the poison data, I'm training a fair classifier, as shown as the dotted line on the right-hand side. But when I'm evaluating that model, I'm evaluating it on uh, real data, which is presumably clean, right? This is a separate test data. And so I'm gonna evaluate it on the clean data, and you can see that the accuracy drops from 0.8 to 0.6, um, skipping all the computation. And um, I mentioned that if you train a fair classifier on the clean data, you actually have a better uh, fair model, um, which is the dotted line on the left. So you can see that there is a strictly worse trade-off. The accuracy drops from 0.8 to 0.6. And so um, therefore, training a model on poison data uh, without um, doing, doing nothing is not a good approach. So 
uh, we don't want to ignore uh, data poisoning. So another straightforward approach is to take a two-step uh, method where we first sanitize the data, we clean it, um, remove all the poisoning, and then perform fair training. Now it turns out that this is also problematic because the individual techniques are not really designed to distinguish data poisoning from bias. And so they end up removing too much um, errors or do, not, do, do nothing. So therefore, we propose a more holistic approach of uh, performing fair and robust training together. And um, we propose the following works. FR train uh, performs so-called adversarial training using clean, a clean validation set, which I'm gonna explain in, in the next slide. Uh, fair, robust sample selection is the recent work um, where we take a different approach of uh, selecting samples uh, without using a validation set. So let me explain these works a little bit in more detail. So FR train has the following model architecture. It's um, uh, training three players together. Um, the, on the top left is a classifier that's predicting recidivism, like whether this person is gonna commit crime, um, yes or no. And there are two discriminators on the right-hand side uh, for fairness and robustness. The one on the top right tries to glean um, the sensitive information from the yes and no answers. And the bottom one tries to distinguish the possibly poisoned data from the top uh, versus the clean data that comes from a separate clean validation set, which we construct separately using um, so-called crowdsourcing methods. Now, if this training is done properly, then um, we can obtain a classifier that is really, that is not only accurate, but is really good at hiding the sensitive uh, information and also makes predictions that are uh, dis indistinguishable from um, when, as if it's making predictions using clean data. And uh, the discriminator for fairness is gonna be really good at uh, gleaning sensitive information. The discriminator for robustness is going to be good at distinguishing poisoned versus uh, clean data. Next approach, uh, fair and robust sample selection, takes um, a, a, alter, a different approach. It doesn't modify the model training. Instead, it modifies the sampling process. So if you're training a neural network like Dean uh, was talking about, then a typical approach is to take, um, to use a, a technique called stochastic gradient descent, where you take a sample of the training data, you train your model a bit, and then you repeat that process. The problem is, um, if your training data is on the left-hand side is um, biased and dirty, noisy, then your random sample is also going to be biased and noisy. And if you train your model on that data, then it's not gonna have the desirable performance. So the idea is to make the sample um, cleaner by discarding uh, samples uh, that have high loss according to the intermediate model, and also making, the, uh, making it more fair by ensuring a fair group ratio uh, based on what the intermediate model is, um, um, how fair it is. And using these two techniques combined, we can uh, significantly improve the uh, fairness and robustness of the trained model. Okay, so those are two works on model-centric approaches. I'd like to briefly talk about my uh, data-centric approach uh, shown uh, below. In particular, I will focus on the slice tuner work. So uh, this work is, um, selectively acquires data for uh, better accuracy and fairness uh, for, for model training. And the motivation is that I mentioned um, data is easier to collect from outside. It's, you can acquire data by using a search engine. And the problem is um, blindly acquiring data is not enough. It's not just because you have a lot of data doesn't mean your model is going to be more responsible. Uh, on the contrary, if your data is, um, your data can be even uh, more biased, which results in worse fairness, for example. So you want to be careful of which data you acquire. And so uh, Tulsi was talking about slices. Uh, slices can be different regions or different genders or different races. And the idea is to um, selectively acquire different amounts of data for the different slices, such that, first of all, the model performs overall well. Um, the total model loss is minimized. And also, the model um, performances across different slices are similar. Uh, that's what we mean by fairness here. And so a slice tuner does that optimization for us um, using learning curves, which uh, indicate how much the model is gonna perform as we acquire more data on a certain slice. So for different slices, we have different amounts of um, uh, data to acquire. 
Once we have that, we can acquire the data and then check the model to see if we need to acquire, um, uh, kind of adjust that ratio and uh, rinse and repeat. So I'm showing you this because uh, it's very important. It's not only important to focus on the model training, but um, also the data because we're, uh, mach machine learning is um, all about learning from data. And so uh, we need to make sure we're preparing the data properly. So in conclusion, responsible AI needs to be addressed in all machine learning steps. I briefly talked about some works on model-centric and data-centric approaches. And uh, the future directions for us are the following, uh, depth, breadth, and usability. So by depth, I mean combining fairness with other responsible AI uh, elements. So Kang was talking about privacy. Also, I'm interested in explainability that Bean was talking about and so on. And breadth, I mean um, addressing these responsible AI issues on, in all machine learning steps, as um, Tulsi was talking about. And also, I think usability is really important because uh, these techniques are going, going to be, become more complicated. They really need to be easily deployable uh, for, even for non-experts. And so um, in our fair and robust sampling work, um, this, this work has the advantage that it's very easy to use because you only need to change the sampling step of the machine learning. So you don't have to do any uh, fancy pre-processing or in-processing uh, model training um, uh, modifications, you just need to change the sampling algorithm, which only requires a single line of code change. So that's kind of the work that we're interested in. Okay, so um, thanks a lot for listening, and um, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for giving a very nice talk and uh, sharing some interesting results on fairness, and those are quite impressive. You know what? Why impressive? Because uh, some of your presented work are done collaborating with me. Okay, that's the reason. Okay, so this is the last presentation as I mentioned earlier. So now let's move on to the, um, the panel discussion. So now we have around uh, 13 minutes. So it's not quite enough, I understand. It's not quite enough, but it's not too short as well. And, but I understand the session is right before lunch. So I know that I understand that um, uh, the running rate is a kind of a crime especially before lunch. So the, let me keep it very short. So just for your sake, actually, here's what I will do. I'll ask a one very uh, simple question per presenter. So in total, how many? Four questions. And if time permits, then I will ask one common question that anybody can answer. Okay, here's what I will do. Okay, that way, I, I think we can have around, uh, we can spend around the 13 minutes. So let's, I have some question. The first question to Tulsi. Okay, okay, let me ask you a question. So according to your talk, actually you proposed, you, you, uh, you were talking about the model pipeline, which is a very impressive. And also that seems to allow for the simplification of the model development, it seems. And, um, but it seems that the, in your model pipeline, you assume that the data you are collected are very big and diverse enough. Okay, that's what I thought in your slide, actually. But in many practical scenarios, actually, so there are many cases, the data are not uh, gathered enough, and also there are some sample biased. So in your framework, is there uh, some component which address this kind of a biased data issue? Okay, can you say a few words yeah, about this? Is this? A, I mean, it's a great question. I think, to your point, there is no such thing as an unbiased data set, right? Any data you collect will be representative of what some communities more than others. There will be certain areas in which the data is well representative, certain when it's not. And especially for a company like Google, where we're talking about a global scale, there's you need to actually have data that represents that global scale, right? Or represents whatever set of users that you're targeting. So we do have tools and resources for evaluating data. And I think it's also important to ensure that your data collection is as effective as possible. I think it's also worth noting too that yes, I think many use cases and many companies and many development processes have limitations on what they can collect and what they can do. And so I think one of the big things that we push for also is transparency around the data that you do collect, right? So what is it? What are the limitations of it? And while the data will have limitations that then just affects how you use your product, right? So for example, if you only collect data from the United States, you should probably assume that the product needs to be deployed in the United States first before you actually build out and scale to other regions. 
right? And so how do you actually think about what the product is interpreted for based on the data that you do have access to and how you build and train the model? Okay, okay very good. So, so uh, actually my uh, question uh, was a little bit different. Actually, so I was thinking about the case where the data itself is just a bias and uh, is there any uh, the component which can address this kind of case? So even if we oh, have a biased data, I mean, so can we build up some algorithm which is a fair and something like that? So that was That's my a good question. question. I think I think it depends. I would say on the use case, right? I think there are methods. So assuming that all data is biased, I think there are methods where you can improve the model training to be improved for like through the loss function and through other methods to actually work better for certain communities and to be really intentional about that in the model training process, right? There's also things you can do in the product design to account for that bias, right? So for example, in the translate case. We know that the data is biased. We know it will continue to be biased. We did things in the product experience at the end state. So I think there are things you can do, but I think it very much depends on the product experience, uh, the use case, and also what you're trying to de-bias against. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot for your clarification. So let's move on to the second question. That is for kang -ho. So kang -ho, here's my question. So you know what? Uh, I was hooked up actually by your title. So your title says what? Improving fairness via federative learning. So from the title, actually, I thought that uh, with the federative learning, which is uh, essentially the decentralized algorithm, we can rather further improve fairness performance relative to a conventional centralized algorithm. That's what I thought, but it seems not the case according to your talk because you mentioned that the, your proposed algorithm, which you named the uh, F, I don't remember, F, F, B, oh, oh, yeah, 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 it's a, it's a FAD, F, B, FAD, F, B, achieved a similar, the, the fairness versus um, accuracy trade-off curve, right? That's what you mentioned, right? So can you clarify that point? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think, um, that's one of the um, common questions that I receive when I give a talk about my work. I think I should have um, clarified it better. So let me just clarify that. So um, I think your understanding is correct that uh, we are not doing improving the fairness compared to decentralized setting where you collect the entire data set, you can do whatever you want, completely ignoring data privacy issue. There's no way we can do better than the centralized training. What I wanted to um, show and what we actually showed in this work is we can achieve a better fairness and better, better fairness accuracy trade-off compared to the setting where you do not collaborate and you just train your models locally and try to ensemble models at the aggregation time. So if you go back to my slide, I, I try to remind the name. So there was decentralized scheme, which is you take my data scheme that one, there's no way we can do better than that. But the other extreme scheme where you train your models locally and try to aggregate those models at the centralized setting, at, at the centralized node, that scheme, we can probably show that that scheme that has no hope to achieve good fairness. So what my title tried to say was, if you do a smarter federated learning, not the vanilla federated learning, you can achieve a way better fairness, accurate trade-off compared to those kind of non-federated local training so that you can achieve even close to decentralized schemes performance trade-off. So hopefully that clarifies your discussion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thanks for the clarification. So it's, okay, then it seems that the baseline that you compare to is a still decentralized algorithm, but not collaborating, right? Something like that. Yes. Okay, so very good. Thanks. Okay. okay, now I'm not hooked up then. Okay, let's move on to the third uh, question for the Bean Kim. So yeah, so from your talk, I understood that um, some, okay, the fairness is a very uh, complicated object. So in order to understand what the fair means, actually we need some discuss with the neural network. That's what uh, dialogue is doing, right? And uh, as a dialogue, we are thinking of the interpretable ML, right? That's what I understood. But I wanted to understand more, actually, more explicit relationship between the fairness and some interpretable ML technique. For example, in your talk, you're talking about salience map, right? As an example for the interpretable ML. So can you say a few words about 
uh, if the sailor's map can help to develop the fair classifier, if that's the case. So can you uh, make a concrete uh, connection between the salience map and some fair classifier? Sure, sure. Um, thanks for the question. I, I love being concrete. So let me actually try to use my work, TCAV, uh, for, for the purpose of the talk where I criticized the <laughs> salience map a little bit, in including my own work in, on salience map. So imagine uh, that you are running, this is actually a, a true story. There's a nature paper came out from an academic institution where they discovered that a classifier, deep learning based classifier is classifying bone fracture based on, not based on the x-ray that's taken from the patient, but, but based on which machine it was used to take the picture. Was it the old machine? Was it a new machine? The color and hue of the, of the machine that was being used. And they knew that because of some sort of this interpretability methods, they, they knew that model was surfacing. When you have that conversation of a pay model, what did you use and what was most important for you? And the model says, well, the model name. Uh, that's when one of a concrete example of when this having this conversation where you didn't quite expect that it would, it would be model name. You probably suspect and hoped that it will be x-ray of some sort. You are mostly curious about where in x-ray is it really looking at the joint that was uh, fractured. But something that unexpected was surfaced thanks to having this dialogue using these interpretability methods. That didn't use TCAP example, but that's one of the concrete examples. Okay, that's very good. And uh, thanks for the, giving me another example, which is more concrete. Okay, and now I can have a better understanding. Okay, thanks a lot. So let's move on to the last question. That is for the, my colleague. Stephen, okay, so I know your work very well <laughs> already. Okay, here's some tough question actually. You know me too well. <laughs> so it seems that the, all of your algorithm, okay, where I collaborate with, <laughs> are targeting scenarios where the sensitive attributes such as the gender and the race are available. However, in many practical scenarios, such sensitive uh, such sensitive attribute information are, may not be available. So can you say a few words about how to address that kind of practically relevant challenging scenarios? Sure, thanks for the sharp question. So um, this is a topic of, you know, this is a recent uh, research direction. I think there are largely two ways to address that. So if you don't have the sensitive uh, information, uh, sometimes you can infer the sensitive attribute using other attributes. For example, for race, um, it's known that people uh, live um, of similar race, tend to live in similar neighborhoods. So just by looking at the zip code, it's known that you can infer the race with some probab high probability. Uh, another example is um, gender. So interestingly, um, you can infer gender by uh, a history of um, websites that are visited. So if you look at the log of websites, um, certain websites attract um, primarily female users while others uh, male users. And so just by looking at some of the logs may indicate uh, the gender. Uh, finally, um, income is also a very sensitive attribute, so you can, you can actually infer income by looking at credit scores. Um, that being said, there's some, some more like serious research. Um, so the, um, these research um, assumes, makes some assumptions that um, certain um, disadvantaged groups have some correlation with uh, sensitive, the actual sensitive group. And so um, what they do is they try to find uh, cluster, uh, clusters or groups where the model underperforms. And so the model is discriminating, right? We don't know which sensitive group that is, but we assume that it is one of the sensitive groups. And then the objective is to try to make the model have more uniform performance um, on all the groups. And so that's how the unfairness can be mitigated. So I believe, I mean, we haven't really investigated that direction too much, but in the future we can combine our techniques with those approaches as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Very calm answer, although I give you a very tough question. So you're well prepared. Very good. Okay, time's up. Unfortunately, I, I cannot give you another question. So time's up. I have to adjourn the meeting. So I personally, I enjoy the talks and the presentation a lot. So I believe this is also the case to the audience. So let's just adjourn the meeting and let's thank all the speakers. And let's just enjoy lunch. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Please give another weekend. Thank you very much, Professor So and our panels and us, our panels who are joining us online. Thank you so much. Uh, we discuss about AI and fairness along with uh, various issues, and also the presenters, professors introduced the studies they are studying. Uh, most of all, they presented the tasks to be studied and discussed in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your insightful session, and as he mentioned, it's time to wrap up the session one.